What's going on guys? Daniel DeBrock here, Director of Education Curriculum at Kabuki Strength and today I'm going to be talking about the fundamentals of program design. I'm going to discuss how to run you through a proper needs analysis, how to identify what you need to focus on, discuss population differences and then actually build out a case study uh, of one of my existing athletes and how I actually implemented a lot of the things that we're going to talk about into designing the program, uh, selecting the exercises, looking at the volume, the exercise progression, things like that. So let's dive right into it. So first off, what is periodization? Periodization is essentially the plan manipulation of training model or sorry training variables over time. Now <clears throat> that brings into uh, brings up, up a couple questions. So first off, what variables do we need to adjust and how do we actually monitor them and adjust them? So essentially we have to think about what the priorities are. So what are your primary goals? Are you a strength-based athlete? Are you a bodybuilder? Are you a field sport athlete? What are your objectives? Maybe you're just looking to lose some body fat. Whatever it is, it's very important that we identify specifically what your goals are and often people have multiple goals. So they want to get bigger and stronger or they want to get you know more athletic while losing weight or whatever it might be. So we also have to make sure that if we have multiple goals we rank order them in a hierarchy to determine what is going to be the primary focus and how we're going to scale the intervention accordingly. Uh, once you have that. Once we've established the goals, then we need to start creating a lifter, uh, essentially a, a lifter profile uh, is, is what we can call it. So this is where we discuss lifestyle variables, we discuss sleep, nutrition, stress, uh, work, maybe relationships, anything outside of the gym as well as inside the gym. This is going to give us a much better understanding of what we actually need to do and how we're going to prescribe uh, exercises, volume, deload, intensity, and all of these things because essentially the training prescription is only one aspect of the total stress being imposed on the organism. If we look at stress from a big picture kind of umbrella standpoint, we can look at it as allostatic load. Allostatic load just refers to the cumulative stress that's being imposed on you. So for instance, physiological, emotional, and psychological stressors are all going to intersect to essentially increase the amount of fatigue or allow you to effectively manage fatigue and create a more robust stimulus and a better adaptive response. So we need to make sure that we're not just looking at the numbers from programming and we're also incorporating everything that's going on outside of the actual gym and the training session itself because that absolutely plays a very significant role. Once you've created that lifter profile, then we can go into population differences. Now the reason why population differences are, are so important is because once you understand where you fit, then we can take good rules of thumb and sort of superimpose that over your profile. Now if you're a coach and you're coaching athletes, we can superimpose it over theirs. If you're a self-coach, we can superimpose it over yours. And that's going to give you a very, very good idea of what the starting point should look like. And then it's just about making some small tweaks and adjustments. And we're going to walk you through step by step on all of that stuff today. So uh, we'll start with sex differences. So men typically have more muscle than women. Uh, actually, you know, before I get into this, I want to kind of make a caveat uh, here. So it's important to understand that population differences are averages. They are not 100% uh, across the board going to be true. Yes, there are women who have more muscle than certain men. Yes, there are women who are going to be stronger than certain men. There are going to be women who maybe have higher testosterone levels even than certain men. However, generally speaking, we see certain trends. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you guys today in order to give you a good baseline understanding of what you'll need to do and what variables are going to influence things like exercise selection, load allocation, volume, frequency, etc. So coming back into sex differences, uh, men typically have more muscle mass than women. Men typically have a higher absolute strength. Uh, generally speaking, they are able to tolerate less load less volume and less frequency than women. Now part of this is because 
because women generally have less tissue and their, their absolute strength is lower, they're not able to create as much systemic disruption uh, within a single training session as, as their male counterpart. And because of that, they're able to tolerate a little bit more. So uh, also they have uh, lower testosterone levels than, than men, which again is going to impact their adaptive response, it's going to uh, affect their recovery, it's going to affect a variety of different things. So uh, these are all important considerations that differentiate men from women. Okay, now there are other ones obviously, but these are some of the, the big ones. Then we look at volume and intensity considerations for a novice versus intermediate versus an advanced athlete. Now there are two important distinctions. One is going to be population differences and one is going to be intra-individual differences depending on where you are in your uh, level of experience. Okay, so what I mean by that is if we take the same individual and have them be a novice and then we watch as this novice progresses to intermediate and then progresses to advanced. Most of the time, an advanced athlete is not going to be able to tolerate the same amount of volume and intensity that, or sorry, more so, more so volume, they won't be able to handle the same type of volume and workloads as a novice. The reason for that is because novices are not as strong, they're not as neurologically developed, they don't have the same type of coordination, they're not capable of, of creating the same level of, of systemic disruption as an advanced athlete. So even though we might take two separate individuals and let's say one is advanced and one is novice and the advanced athlete is doing way more volume than their novice counterpart. Even though that can absolutely be true in some cases, if we were to remove the second individual and simply take that advanced athlete in the vast majority of cases, as an advanced lifter, they're not going to be able to tolerate the same amount of intensity, frequency, or volume as they could when they were an intermediate and even a novice. Okay, so I hope that makes sense uh, because that's very important. So essentially, what you need to know is as you go from novice to intermediate to advanced, you require less intensity, less volume, less frequency. Now that's generally speaking, and that's going to get you into the ballpark in most cases. Now when we're looking at specificity, so obviously volume, intensity, and things like that are a component of specificity, but when we're looking at specificity, we're talking a little bit more broadly as well. So we're also including exercise selection, we're including um, you know, load selection, we're including the, the actual execution, so are you wearing a belt, are you not wearing a belt, um, is it low bar, is it a different variation, all sorts of different things. And as you go from novice to intermediate to advanced, the higher level you get, the more specificity you require. Now the reason for that is because as a novice, you can handle much more exercise variety. And in fact, exercise variety is actually going to increase your ability to learn the motor patterns. Okay, so research shows that exercise variety actually increases motor learning, especially in novices. So, the thing is, not every exercise is going to necessarily transfer to your 1RM squat. Now as a novice, you might do leg press or even leg extensions or lunges, and that might actually be sufficient to get you a stronger squat. However, when you progress to intermediate and advanced, doing leg extensions and lunges is not going to get you a better squat. Why? Because we don't have enough of these things converging. We don't have specificity in terms of the actual movement pattern. We don't have specificity in terms of the absolute load on the bar because if you compare uh, a lunge, the weight you could use on a lunge versus a squat, they're just not the same. If we look at you know, the, the load vectors and how all of these things are converging, we just don't have enough specificity. Now, as you, if you think about it, the better you get, the less adaptive reserve that you actually have. Because if this is where you're training and this is your max capacity to recover, the gap between that really starts to shrink the more advanced you become. So we essentially have to make more or get more out of the same amount of work. So we need to be a lot more clever in how we're prescribing loads, volumes, frequency, exercise selection, uh, tempos, and all of the different things that we're gonna do, you know, in terms of like, 
even bands or chains or whatever it might be, okay? So specificity has to increase as you become better and as you become more experienced. Uh, baseline activity level relative to workload. So what I mean by this is how active are you just generally speaking? How active are you throughout the day? What's your step count? If you're someone who gets, you know, a thousand steps a day and you don't really do any other exercise outside of powerlifting or, or strength training, you're not a very active person. You're a very sedentary individual, even though you still resistance train. You still would be classified as a sedentary individual because your level of actual baseline activity is very low. Now, baseline activity does correlate to the actual workload that you can do. Someone who's very active, who's going hiking all the time, or just you know playing rec sports or whatever, is going to have a higher tolerance to higher workloads than someone who's inactive. Now, that's a pretty obvious thing. However, I think a lot of powerlifters, especially, uh, just assume that because they're doing their resistance training, you know, four or five times a week, that their baseline activity is pretty good. It's probably not. Uh, the average American takes about 3,500 steps a day, which is pretty damn low. Right? If you're not getting a minimum of 8,000 steps per day, a minimum, you're leaving significant benefits from aerobic conditioning uh, and just sort of aerobic health and, and capacity on the table. Uh, so you want to make sure that your baseline aerobic fitness and just general activity levels are actually high enough to permit you training at the types of intensities and maintaining the level of output that you need to to really support your training. Now not everyone is going to get there. Not everyone's going to be there or even want to be there. So you need to make sure that you're scaling the workload to whatever your baseline activity level is. And that can change as you become more fit and more advanced uh, as well as just with the type of training that you're doing. Next we're going to talk about age. Uh, relative to some of these uh, training variables like volume, intensity, frequency. Okay, so as you become older, right, a 20-year-old is going to be able to tolerate a lot more frequency, intensity, and volume than a 70-year-old, right? Um, a 30-year-old probably going to be able to handle a pretty solid amount. So, so there is some sort of relationship. Now, it's not linear because you might become advanced at 40, Right? You might start lifting at 30 and your tolerance to workload and intensity is super low because you're really out of shape, but then you get in great shape by the time you're, let's say, 45. And so even though you're older, your level of fitness is way higher, so you can tolerate way more. However, if we were to assume that you would have started training at 20, your ability at 20 is probably going to be a lot more than it would be at 45. Right Now that's pretty common, pretty common knowledge, so um, shouldn't really be anything too difficult to understand. Uh, now, then we go into lifestyle. So, what does your sleep look like? Are you getting six hours sleep, seven hours sleep, eight, nine? How consistent is it? Are you waking up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom? Are you doing that multiple times? Are you getting disrupted sleep? Do you wake up feeling really groggy? Are you going to bed super late? Even if you're getting eight hours, are you getting eight hours within that kind of optimal window of like, you know, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. or something like that? Or are you getting to bed at like 2 a.m. and then sleeping until 10 p.m. or something like that, or sorry, 10 a.m., right? So those things make a big difference. So what is your sleep quality like? What's the duration? Do you have a sleep hygiene, uh, a, a sleep hygiene routine? Do you have sleep latency issues? So you get to bed at a good time, but you have trouble falling asleep. Do you have trouble staying asleep? Is the sleep quality good? That's very important to, to note, and that is absolutely going to affect your recovery, your, your subjective evaluation of effort, your ability to maintain high levels of output, your recovery just in between sets and in between sessions. So it's gonna affect a lot. Then we can look at your, your actual diet. Are you getting enough calories? Are you getting sufficient protein? What is your nutrient timing protocol? Uh, are you taking supplements? Are you taking you know, PEDs, performance enhancing supplements? Um, so there's a variety of different things uh, in terms of lifestyle that are absolutely going to affect your ability to recover and perform on a, on a consistent basis. We can look at stress and your mood and your general enjoyment of training. It's very important that you enjoy your training. Now yes, there are definitely periods where training is fucking brutal and it's super hard, but you should still always be enjoying your training and there, there are going to be certain periods where you're not going to enjoy it as much and that's normal. But for the most part, you should really enjoy your training. You should be passionate about what you're doing because if you're not and it's just a grind every single day, you're just not going to be investing the same level of effort into your training. You're not going to be as engaged, which is going to significantly hurt your results in the long run. Um, 
your stress is going to impact your ability to perform as well in, in your recovery. So what are you doing from a stress management standpoint? Are you high stress, low stress, medium stress? Uh, are you well hydrated? Right? Hydration plays a major role in performance. A 1% reduction in hydration can, redu can result in up to a 10% reduction in, in strength performance. A 2 to 4% reduction in hydration status can result in up to a 20 to 30% reduction in work capacity. So all of these things are variables that exist outside of the gym that can directly influence your ability to perform in the gym and recover and do so on a consistent basis. So getting that profile, really understanding where you fit on all of these things is going to make a lot more sense of how you're actually performing. Maybe you're looking at your lifestyle and you're like, man, I'm crushing everything, I'm doing everything so well, but I'm just not seeing progress. Okay, but you're only getting like five hours sleep. Well, that's not enough. And then all of a sudden you dial that in and now your tolerance to volume and workload goes way up. So being aware of these things and how it's going to impact the broader picture is extremely important. Then we look at uh, recovery and orthopedic health. So recovery is much more than just, you know, how many times a week you're training and how many rest days you have. It's much more than even just your sleep, although your sleep is hugely important. It's also your psychological, social, and, and emotional well-being, right? Do you have generally like a good life? Are you enjoying your life? Do you feel fulfilled? Now, it might sound like I'm getting a little, you know, airy-fairy and this is kind of an esoteric conversation now, but these things are incredibly important because your subjective evaluation of, of life, of your fulfillment, of all of these things are going to permeate other aspects of your life. If you're feeling frustrated, if you're depressed, if you're sad, if you're anxious, all these things, that is absolutely going to affect your ability to perform. That's absolutely going to add another layer of stress to your system. If we refer back to what we talked about, allostatic load being this big, broad, all-encompassing uh, concept, then all of these things are going to play a role in that. And they're going to, to take away from resources that would otherwise be directed towards your recovery and restoration. Stress, anxiety, low sleep, all of these things are also going to affect your orthopedic health and your risk of injury. So, do you have an element of injury risk management built into your program? I'm not talking about foam rolling or static stretching or any of that stuff. Not saying that that stuff is, is terrible and you should never do it. Personally, I think it's a very low ROI. All the research shows that and most of the high level coaches kind of say the same things. However, Still not saying that you can't do it. If you want to do it, go right ahead. However, there are important things that you need to be doing in order to sustain health over a long period of time. If you look at all the top athletes, you know, yes, sometimes you get genetic freaks who lift for like five years and they're just insanely strong, but the vast majority of the top level lifters have been doing it for 15 or 20 years. Now, there's no way to do that unless you stay healthy or reasonably healthy through most of that process. So what are you actually doing to stay healthy? Powerlifters, in particular, only really do any movement in the sagittal plane. So are you doing any movements that are taking you outside of the sagittal plane? Are you doing any maybe lateral movements? Are you doing something like a Cossack squat? Are you doing something that's going to challenge you from a transverse perspective? So some sort of anti-rotation drill. Are you going to be doing, um, you know, maybe like single leg dumbbell RDLs, which has uh, an anti-flexion, uh, as well as an anti-rotation component to it. Are you going to be integrating the lumbopelvic complex and that sort of oblique sling by moving on one leg? Are you going to be doing uniloaded activities that are challenging you to stabilize and, and rebalance, right? So there's a lot of different things that you'll need to consider in order to actually sustain health long-term that aren't necessarily going to directly enhance your performance, right? So for instance, um, a single leg dumbbell RDL right, that's probably not gonna do anything to help your squat or your deadlift directly, right? It's not gonna increase force production, it's not gonna increase your strength or your muscle or anything like that, not really, right? There's a billion other exercises you'd pick to do that, but a much better job before you get to the single leg dumbbell RDL. However, single leg dumbbell RDLs are fantastic for developing the stability through the pelvis and the integration of the, the core stability into the pelvic stability while you're in uh, hip flexion and extension. So they're very, very important for developing stability through that motion, which can translate to better overall stability in the squat and deadlift, and just keep you a little bit healthier and increase your tissue tolerance over time. So even though it's not directly uh, 
you know, impacting your, your performance or enhancing your performance, it's going to indirectly allow you to continue pushing for longer, or at least, you know, it can. So, you know, this is just a hypothetical example. However, whatever exercise that you might do from an orthopedic standpoint for yourself, those are absolutely going to contribute to staying healthy, and the healthier you can stay means less time off from injuries, uh, less frequency of deloading, more time spent in productive training cycles, and less time you know, spent reducing load or having to alter exercises or pulling out of meats because you're, you know, tweaked your pec or whatever it might be, okay? Um, now, we... Uh, kind of need to come back to the, this discussion of periodization. Uh, and we are gonna get into the case study next, but first I just wanna talk about this very briefly. Uh, we are gonna talk about uh, John Kiley's critique of modern periodization. So again, the title of, of his paper in 2012 was Critiques of Modern Periodization. Fantastic read if you guys are interested uh, and you guys kinda of wanna nerd out a little bit. But essentially one of the things that he highlights is that most of modern periodizations really just predicated on tradition as opposed to actual sound scientific evidence. Now that's not to say that long-term planning is bad. You absolutely should have long-term planning. His critique, uh, and, and I don't necessarily want to speak for him, so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just say that my interpretation of his critique was that the longer you start planning and the further out you extrapolate, the less predictive precision you have for the athlete state of preparedness. So I can, it's gonna be hard to predict the athlete state of preparedness just this week, not to mention in three months from now. You don't know what's gonna happen. You don't, maybe they're gonna be sick, maybe they're gonna be injured, maybe they're gonna you know, have a death in the family or they have to move for work or maybe they're in finals for school or whatever is going on. You have no way really of predicting what's going to happen to you. And the farther out you plan, if you're getting all these details lined up beforehand, your ability to do that effectively is really significantly stunted just because the reality is we don't have a lot of predictive power in those cases. So should there be a long-term plan? Absolutely. Olympic athletes have these quadrennial plans and those are fantastic. However, the main difference there is that they're not necessarily planning out every detail and rep and set and exercise and all of that stuff. What they're doing is they're saying, hey, we're gonna be focusing on a bridge block here, we're gonna be focusing on a hypertrophy or a developmental block here, and then here we're gonna be focusing on strength and peaking and, and whatever, right? So it looks a little bit more like that, but it's very high level conceptual and they don't necessarily hash out all those details. Now, one thing that I'm a big fan of is what's called like a, a feed forward uh, approach to, to program design where essentially you shorten that cycle so you have a much faster feedback loop. Uh, essentially what that looks like is doing weekly coaching. Now this is not the only way. There's plenty of people who coach people for a month at a time or three months at a time and they do a fantastic job. So it's not a critique on them. It's just pointing out some very real limitations and saying, hey, this is a potential alternative, but if you're already doing what you're doing and you're getting fantastic results, then hey, you know what? Go right ahead, be my guest. There's many ways to skin a cat. So uh, a weekly approach to programming allows you to keep your finger on the pulse. You, you write your microcycle and say, okay, how did you do if you're coaching an athlete? Or if you're coaching yourself, you say, how, how was the week? How did it go? Well, you know what? I feel pretty good. I think I can maybe push a little bit harder on, on the squats. Uh, but okay, you know, maybe I'll try increasing the load before I increase the volume. You do week number two, you increase the load and you're like, holy smokes, that was way harder. Okay, maybe I'll keep the volume here and I'll just kind of slowly, you know, try and creep the weight up bit by bit. And it kind of allows you to make those subtle adjustments on a weekly basis instead of doing something and then not necessarily actually being able to review whether or not it worked until the end of the month or the end of three months or whatever it might be. So it allows you to kind of remain objective. Now, one thing that I will say about this approach is if you're someone who's super neurotic and super obsessive, it might be a little bit difficult for you to remain uh, emotionally disengaged and remain objective when you have such a short time course. So there are pros and cons to this approach. However, it is something that I just kind of wanted to toss out there. Um, so let's get into the actual case study and how we're going to build a program and put everything that we talked about into practice into an actual four day per week program, okay? So this is a case study of an individual uh, that, that I currently coach, actually. <laughs> so, sex is male. They are 32 years old. They are 245 pounds and 23% body fat. Now, we didn't talk about body fat necessarily, 
but it somewhat is indicative of at, at activity level outside the gym. Not very precise, but in this case it somewhat is. Um, their experience levels, so they're intermediate level lifter. Uh, their general activity is kind of moderate, so they weren't, you know, super, super active, but they weren't getting even 8,000 steps, so, you know, uh, it, it, not, not that much activity. Um, they don't have any injuries, however, once they reach a certain uh, threshold of volume, uh, like once the sets get too high, they do start getting hip pain, uh, historically. They sleep about six to seven hours. Their stress is moderate to high on a regular basis. They're only getting about three liters of water. Their nutrition, uh, they're getting sufficient protein, but they don't really track other macros or follow any sort of nutrient timing strategy, and they don't take any supplements. Uh, their competitive cycle, they're currently in an off-season developmental block, and performance bottlenecks are in the squat, they have weak quads, uh, and, and their bracing is a little bit off. Um, in the bench press, they're weak off the chest, so when they fail, it's always like right off the chest. And in the deadlift, they are weak at lockout. They're also sensitive to ramping workloads. So if we start progressing workloads, um, even a little bit sometimes, they're pretty sensitive to it. So we need to make sure that any sort of workload progressions week to week are, are fairly small in order for them to adapt. So let's go over the, uh, the basics, okay? So in terms of total cumulative volume, bench press. This individual is only doing 13 total sets of bench press throughout the week. Pretty low, it's not a whole lot. Because um, that's not just the bench press, that's all horizontal pressing exercises for this particular individual. They're only doing 13 sets. Uh, they're doing eight total sets of squats and 11 total sets of deadlift. Now most of the time, you'll have the highest uh, number of your sorry you'll have the highest volume in bench press second highest volume will generally be in squats and then the lowest volume is generally in deadlift because those are the most fatiguing that's the most fatiguing exercise of the three powerless however once I actually go through this you'll understand why we're doing more volume in squ well we're actually not doing more volume in deadlift but technically it's written like that um, but you'll understand why from a work capacity standpoint so day one we're going to do bench press one set of five at 2 RIR, then we're going to do four sets of three at the same load with 90 seconds rest between sets. So the reason why we're doing 90 seconds rest is because I want to increase this individual's work capacity. We, we talked about how their body fat percentage is pretty high, uh, we talked about how they're generally not very active, we talked about how their tolerance to load is not very good, right? And I mean even doing like 13 sets of bench press is really just not a lot, even at someone who's 245. Right? So we want to make sure that we can actually increase their work capacity so that they can train to the degree that's going to be the most stimulative for them to actually see the best results. So we need to increase their aerobic conditioning, we need to increase their work capacity, which is why you'll notice throughout this program we're doing a lot of stuff like supersets or just like EMOMs and things like that to, to expose them to you know decent top end loads but also increase their work capacity through some of their back off work. So we're doing a, a drop in repetitions but we're not doing a drop in load. We're just keeping the load static and just taking a shorter rest period and just banging them out. So it's really gonna accumulate a high degree of fatigue, but that's intentional. Then we're gonna superset feet up dumbbell bench press and single arm lat pull down. We're gonna do two sets of 15 to 20 reps each. So again, very high repetition. You'll remember that we're currently in an off season, so we have a lot more flexibility in terms of what we can do which is why we're doing such high repetition stuff. So again, we're looking to push his work capacity, we're taking shorter rest periods, and we're really looking to put on some muscle, and this is a, a very different than what we do in a competitive cycle, which is also good from an orthopedic standpoint because we're changing the stress and how it's being applied to the tissues. So again, if you refer back to uh, sex differences, if you refer back to age, if you refer back to body weight, activity level, all the things that we talked about from a population standpoint, and then we start looking at this stuff, you're like, oh, okay, this starts to make sense a little bit, right? Then we're doing easy bar French press, two sets of 15. So again, we're doing French press because triceps, you know, are, are really important in the bench press, but the tricep serves various functions, elbow extension, stability in the overhead position, and then also shoulder extension behind us. Um, and so <laughs> by being overhead, it's going to help with overhead stability a little bit, and it's going to provide a little bit of a novel stimulus um, to, uh, to, to how we're actually loading the triceps and the tissues that's not just in this you know, plane right here. Day number two. Um, 
<coughs> oh, sorry. Um, one thing to note as well, you'll, you'll notice that uh, we're doing feet up dumbbell bench press. The feet up dumbbell bench press is, uh, is essentially to get more loading on the pecs. So we're not having any arch, we're not doing anything crazy like that. We're just keeping it really simple, but getting a lot of volume on his pecs in general because off the chest is where he's missing, which is usually indicative of a muscular deficiency, specifically in, in the pecs. So we need to develop more pec strength, which is why we're doing a little bit more volume directly to hit the pecs. Uh, if you remember back when I mentioned that uh, this particular individual had weak quads, uh, again, it's not weak from an absolute stance, it's weak relatively speaking. So his quads are a little bit uh, too weak, so we need to make sure we build that up. So we're doing SSB squats to make sure that we can prioritize loading the bands on the knee extensors. We're doing a top set of four to six reps. I'm giving a little bit of a range. And then he's gonna be doing uh, two to three reps in reserve, okay? So then we're gonna do some back off sets at four to six reps with 90% of the top set. So let's say he does 100 kilos for six reps on his top set, we're gonna do 90 kilos, so 10% reduction, on, on his back off work for again, four to six reps. We're gonna keep a static load, and that's one of the reasons why we have rep range, is so you can still stay within that rep range even as fatigue accumulates over the course or the duration of the sets. Then we're gonna do stiff leg deadlifts, two sets of eight to 10 at two to three reps in reserve. Now you remember, he struggled at the lockout at the top end of his deadlift. So we're gonna be doing stiff leg deadlifts to really strengthen up his posterior chain and put him at a disadvantage to really hammer in that strength and development of the hips in particular. Then we're gonna be doing chest supported rows and goblet Cossack squats. Now we're gonna be doing two sets of 12 to 15 chest supported rows and then two sets of 10 to 12 goblet Cossack squats. Now the reason why we're doing chest supported row is because after squats and deadlift, your low back is probably gonna be pretty trashed. So we don't wanna be doing heavy barbell rows or unsupported rows, or at least I don't necessarily like doing that because especially this guy's bigger, it's gonna just destroy his low back, right? So doing a chest supported variation allows him to still get some really good stimulus on his muscles, get good hypertrophy work while simultaneously sparing his low back and his core. Uh, then we're doing the Cossack squats because again, as I mentioned previously, he was struggling with a little bit of instability and some bracing issues. So we're doing Cossack squats to get him a little bit more stable in those end ranges from side to side so we can uh, sort of balance out any of the bilateral discrepancies that he might have. And then also we're gonna put him in end range positions uh, where he can actually build up a little bit more of a tissue tolerance so that he's more stable and if he gets out of position, it's going to mean you know, a less likelihood of him actually getting injured. Right, so again, this also has an orthopedic benefit as well as a, you know, an indirect performance enhancing benefit. Day number three, so we're benching twice per week. Uh, we've got floor press, four sets of four to six reps, two to three RIR, we're using a static load the whole time. Uh, then we're gonna do narrow grip incline bench press to get shoulders and triceps a little bit, and we're doing two sets of 10, sorry, eight to 10 at two to three reps in reserve. After that, we're supersetting Penle rows with dumbbell overhead press. We're gonna go 12 to two sets of 12 to 15 reps for each of those. Again, taking a short rest period and then doing some face pulls after that. Now face pulls, again, are more for uh, just enhancing the, the health of the shoulders, uh, making sure that we're actually training, you know, posterior delts, we're training a lot of the, the kind of external rotation ability in the positions that are going to allow you to continue pushing at a high level so this is just basically supporting your capacity to actually tolerate higher workloads without getting a little banged up. Then day number four, this is our last day. We're gonna do two inch block deadlifts, top set of five at two to three RIR. So again, this individual struggles at the top of their uh, rep, but part of it is actually because they're losing position at the bottom. So they're relying on their glutes a little too much, but then at the same time, their, their glutes are just generally weak. So it's kind of like a, a double whammy, unfortunately, for this particular individual. So we're doing some block pulls to get their hips a little bit stronger and expose their hips to higher load more frequently. But then we're gonna do some back off work. We're gonna do deadlifts, eight set of one at the same load every minute on the minute. So if I were to do, let's say two sets of four, uh, after my two sets of five, and I was, you know, or, or, or anything like that, I would only get two exposures to the first repetition. And especially for, for, well, for all your lifts, the first rep is the most important because that's what's counted in competition, obviously, right? You only get one opportunity. So 
getting him to have eight exposures to first reps gives us more opportunity to practice the specific skill that we're trying to develop, which is better technical execution of the deadlift, okay? Making sure that we're not letting the knees kick back, we're not loading into the hips prematurely, we're using the leg drive and we're establishing a really strong lockout position through our bracing. So we get eight exposures and simultaneously, we're doing something that's going to be pretty tough for this individual. Um, because you only get a minute rest in between and we're not doing a low drop, right? So even though we're doing less reps, for this individual it's going to bang them up and then we're going to be able to slowly progress over, over time, uh, the amount of volume and stuff like that that we can actually put in, in the density of the, uh, sorry, we can increase the density of the work that we're doing in these EMOMs by increasing the total number of sets they're doing uh, or even maybe decrease the number of, uh, sorry, the, the rest periods or, or whatever. This is just kind of the first week of this block, right? So this is the very first starting point. Then we're going to do leg press, two sets of 15 to 20. So again, weak quads, we need more quad strength, we're doing leg press. The reason why we're not doing squats again is because this particular individual can't handle squats at a very high frequency. They can only do what I like to call a 1.5 frequency, which is like an actual squat or squat variation, and then some sort of derivative, like leg press, pendulum squat, belt squat, Bulgarian split squat, some sort of other externally stabilized uh, or, or somewhat supported uh, movement. So we're getting direct work on the quads, but less systemic fatigue because we're not loading, uh, we're not doing any axial loading because we don't have a barbell on our back. Then we're doing a superset, neutral grip pull-ups, two sets of AMRAPs, so as many reps as possible. And then we're following that up with a single leg dumbbell RDL, contralaterally loaded. So contralateral just means if the left leg is down and planted, the right hand's gonna hold the dumbbell. If the right leg is planted, the left hand's holding the dumbbell. So this is an anti-rotation force that we're having to resist. And then we're also going into hip flexion and extension while we're executing the actual lift. So we're doing uh, two sets of 10 to 12 of the single leg dumbbell RDLs. Again, that's a super set. And then we're gonna finish off with some pal-off press, two by 30 seconds per side. So again, anti-rotation drill, just to help integrate uh, the core into it. And then you can even progress that into maybe like a split squat pal-off press, or a squat with a pal-off press, or some sort of movement, right, that, that's gonna have a little bit better dynamic correspondence. Um, and that's, that's basically it. So that's the first week of this particular individual's training. As you can see, we looked at their age, we looked at their work capacity, we looked at their aerobic fitness, we looked at uh, you know, their actual strength level, their tolerance to load, how much volume they can handle, exposure to higher intensities, uh, and, and what they need basically to get better by looking at population differences, by constructing an actual lifter profile, and then taking all of that information and siphoning it down into an actual program just for one week to see how they do. And then from there, we can make iteration week after week. And you'll probably only want to make one iteration, maybe two small iterations at the most each week. Even that's quite a lot. I generally will make maybe one little tweak, let it ride for a little while, and then maybe make one little tweak again because that way you can really determine which specific variables are driving their performance adaptations. If you liked the video and you found this helpful, please make sure you subscribe, like, follow, do all that fun stuff, and I will see you guys on the next video.